If you've ever tried playing an electric guitar that's not plugged into an amp, you might notice that you can barely hear the strings. Why is that? Well, remember, sound comes to your ear via sound waves that travel through the air. So the guitar string, when it vibrates, it vibrates the air and it comes to your ear. So the string is not vibrating very much air, so you don't hear the sound very much. An acoustic guitar, on the other hand, vibrates much more air, and so the sound is much louder and more energy is coming to your ear. Let's see how this happens. Topic, forced vibrations. <laughs> Why does a guitar have a hollow box? To keep clothes while traveling. <laughs> Not at all. Huh? Wait, I'll explain. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever we strike an object, it vibrates. <laughs> Sometimes these vibrations influence other objects to vibrate. <laughs> the vibrations which take place under the influence of an external periodic force are called forced vibrations. So whenever I see delicious food, my stomach starts to vibrate. Is this a type of forced vibration? Please concentrate. A guitar has a hollow box which holds quite a huge volume of air. Hmm. Now, when we strike its string, <laughs> it starts to vibrate. These vibrations influence the air in the hollow box, producing forced vibrations in them. <laughs> now we know that vibrations in air produce sound. Hence, as a huge volume of air is vibrating, the sound produced is louder. <laughs> if I take this tuning fork and strike it and let it vibrate all by itself, you can hear it. But if I touch it to a sounding board, you can hear the volume increase. That's because now there's a larger surface area vibrating more air. And so, more air vibrating, louder sound. It's my dog's dog food bowl. If you've ever used a music box, this uses the same principle of vibrating more air to create a louder sound. Let's click here to find out. And then lastly, let's take a look at the example of a tuning fork uh, mount, mounted on a sounding box. That's the purpose of this box, to create uh, more vibration of air so we can hear more volume of sound. Another vocabulary word that you'll want to become familiar with is natural frequency. What is that? If you set something into vibration, it's going to vibrate at what's called its natural frequency. That's the frequency that it just wants to vibrate at. For example, I have two different springs here. If I hang equal weights on them and let them oscillate, you can see one of them oscillates at a different frequency. That's the natural frequency for that spring and mass. And this is the natural frequency for this spring and mass, just like these different size tuning forks. That's the natural frequency for that tuning fork. And that's the natural frequency for that smaller tuning fork. And yet a different size tuning fork has a different natural frequency. This wine glass, that's its natural frequency. What if we applied a forced vibration to an object and it just so happened that the forced vibration matched its natural frequency? What do you think would happen? Well, this is what we do when we swing on a swing. If we wanna go higher and make the amplitude of our swing greater, we kick our legs, but we have to kick them in tune or in, in sync with the swinging of the swing. Here's another example. What if two tuning forks that have the same natural frequency, what if we use one to forcibly vibrate the second? 
let's see a demonstration of what happens. can see the amplitude of the vibration of the second tuning fork grew even though it was never itself struck. Each compression of air molecules from the first tuning fork act like little pushes on the second tuning fork that are right in sync with its natural frequency. So like kicking your legs on the swing, each successive push from the air molecules creates larger and larger vibration of the second tuning fork. When I struck the tuning fork, it emitted a single frequency, but many objects, when you strike them or set them into vibration, they emit several different frequencies at the same time. In fact, this is what gives different vibrating objects their characteristic sound. If you weren't looking at, at me and I played the note C on the piano, or played the note C on a clarinet, you could readily distinguish which instrument I was using because they have what's called different harmonic content. Let's learn about this. I've made myself my own little musical instrument here. It's just a straw that has been made into a double reed instrument. And my app on my iPad here, this is a frequency analyzer I can see all the frequency content of my straw instrument here. There we go, I captured the frame. And you can see right here, the fundamental frequency, that's the lowest one and the largest one, that's about 260 Hertz. There's many other frequencies happening at the same time, however. Here is that fundamental frequency of the straw. You see it's about 260 hertz on my logarithmic scale here. And it is also uh, the one with the largest magnitude. So when we say or ask ourselves, what note is that? This is what we're responding to. This is the note that we hear. All these other frequencies are there just giving it its characteristic sound. On my laptop here, I have a website called Online Tone Generator. So I can dial in the frequency and I can play the, the frequency that I want to hear. So my iPad app told me that my straw instrument was about two, had a fundamental frequency of 260 hertz. So I'm going to play 260 hertz with the Online Tone Generator here. And I've also captured that tone with the software on my iPad. So let's compare them. So here are the two readouts. The top picture is the tone generator from my computer at set at 260 hertz. And here you can see the fundamental frequency at 260 with two other frequencies present. But when you look at the straw frequency content, here's the fundamental frequency of 260 matching the 260 of the tone generator. So to our ear, they sound like the same note, but you can see uh, the much higher harmonic content of the straw. Hey, what's up? It's a Wick for Wikimedia Tutorials. And today I'm gonna to talk about harmonics. I think I've asked the question why that an A note on a piano sounds different than an A note on a guitar, even though they're both playing an A note. This has got to do with the harmonic content. The harmonic content of a sound can be uh, categorized in two groups, and that is the fundamental frequency, which is the sine wave which determines the pitch of the sound, and then we have the harmonics, which are the sine waves that are whole multiple numbers of the fundamental frequency. The fundamental frequency of an A2 note is 110 Hz. The harmonics would then be at 220, which is the second harmonic and exactly an octave up. 
Then we've got 330, which happens to be an A4 note, that is the third harmonic. The fourth harmonic is again an octave higher. So you can see that a doubling in frequency represents an octave. The seventh is an unrelated pitch, and the eleventh again is an unrelated pitch. And that simply means that our ears really can't relate a pitch to it. Let's take a listen at the harmonic skill of this A2 note. So in this project I'm going to take a look at the fundamental frequency and I'm going to take a look at the instrument sound and I'm going to compare that with a frequency analyzer so you can see the harmonics. We've just seen that the distance between an A2 and an A3 is a doubling in frequency. This is called an octave and it's perceived by our ears as being the same pitch. So an A2 is at 110 Hz, an A3 is at 220, an A4 is at 440 and an A5 is at 880 Hz. Let's talk more about the physics of waves and instruments. Let's compare stringed instruments and wind instruments. We'll start off with stringed instruments. Check this out. What happens when a string is plucked? The string starts out with an initial displacement in the shape of a triangle. Upon being released, the string snaps back towards its equilibrium position and oscillates up and down, quickly decaying as damping and friction effects remove energy. The details happen too quickly to see them with actual speed, so let's take a look at the plucked string in slow motion through a high-speed camera at 1200 frames per second. And that's what happens when a string is plucked. A very important idea that you're seeing here is that the wave reflects. When it reaches the other side, it bounces back and comes back towards the sender. So if there was a periodic wave being generated, the waves traveling to the right would interfere with the waves reflecting back. So you have to think back to our last section when we talked about wave interference. What happens when more than one wave is in the same place at the same time? They interfere with each other. So what we have here is a frequency generator. It's connected to what's called a wave driver. It's just a speaker. It's going to pump up and down at whatever frequency I set this guy to. When this guy pumps up and down, well, he sends a wave. He sends a wave down to this end, the wave reflects, comes back. Now, if I set it to just uh, any old frequency, let me just uh, turn this on. Well, yeah, let's go a little higher. So it's sending waves back and forth. But these waves are out of sync, if you like. They're, they're not exhibiting con consistently constructive or destructive interference at any one point. But if I set it here, for example, I have what's called a standing wave. That is, the wave that's, that's sent down and reflects constructively interferes with the next wave that comes down right at this point. Now the waves that reflect, that come down and reflect, destructively interfere with the incoming waves right here. And that's called a node. I can touch it and it still is working. So the node is not moving. Here it's moving up and down, and here it's moving up and down. And we'll see that in a second with the high speed camera. Thank you.